that was an amazingly powerful depiction. What I really saw was that the trade is global and everyone's impacted, whether we think about the people who are in Mexico or the people in the US, everybody's impacted. But let me uh, reiterate how thankful we are that everybody has come to join us today to see the trade and then to hear our panelists. Let me just give a little bit about the numbers. We know that this epidemic is more than numbers, but um, for the most recent statistics we have, there are about 50,000 deaths in America, and this was in 2017, and this is only provisional, and we know that these numbers are growing. When we think about Texas, um, there are fewer deaths, and in fact, Texas is not one of these high incident states. There were about 1,500 deaths the last time it was reported, but we know that these deaths are terribly undercounted in Texas because we don't have opioids as a reportable cause of death, and we also have uh, a lack of medical examiners. Some people may think this isn't a problem in the Brazos Valley, but for the last statistics I've seen, I think it was 214, there were 50 deaths, and my guess is there are many more, and people in this room probably know people who have had overdoses and also who have died. Um, this, this whole epidemic is incredibly complex, and what it means when you have something that's so complex, you need to bring everyone together for the solution. That's why we established the Health Science Center Opioid Task Force. It's also why we have the panelists here today. These are people who are on the front lines in the Brazos Valley. They're dealing with this epidemic, with addictions every single day. And um, just let me introduce people, and we have one change in the lineup. First, we have a, a medical doctor, Dr. Andrew Giannotti, and he's an addiction medicine <coughs> specialist with Symmetra. And yes, there are specialists now in addiction. There are people who are actually certified. We were going to have uh, Catherine Wright, who was a sergeant with the Brazos County Detention Center. She got sick, but in her place, we have a colleague, Dr. Joy Alonzo, who's in the College of Pharmacy, and she's somebody out in the community doing what Dr. Uh, Byington said, actually working on harm reduction strategies. We have Cindy Soltes, who's with the um, Brazos Valley Council of Alcohol and Substance Abuse, and they do amazing things for treatment services in our community. Additionally, we have a person in recovery, and this is Lindsay Rufino, and she's going to tell you her personal story. Years ago, she wouldn't have told you her personal story, but I think this is just like the wall that we have. People are stepping forward and telling their stories and coming forth. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have the panelists start off, and they're going just to introduce themselves, tell again who they are, and give just sort of a personal reflection of who they are and what their jobs are. And let's start with you, Cindy. I guess it's on. Hi, um, I'm Cindy Saltis, and I work for the Brazos Valley Council on Alcohol and Substance Abuse, and I've been with BV CASA probably 18 plus years. Um, I'm the Director of Treatment and Intervention Services at BV CASA. Um, just to let you know a little bit about what we do at BV CASA, we have a prevention department that teaches life skills using curricula in the community. Uh, with our in our schools um, we also do intervention services which means that we evaluate people to see um, the level of care they may need or if they have a problem with substance use disorders and where they need to be placed for treatment and uh, we have a pregnant and postpartum intervention program and we work with um, mothers that are addicted to opiates or or other drugs um, to make sure that they deliver healthy babies um, and we also offer adult and adolescent IOP, which is outpatient treatment, um, uh, four nights a week for the adults and uh, adolescents as, as um, individualized care. Uh, so that's what we do. We do prevention, intervention, and treatment. And I've 
kind of wore all the hats of all the programs in the last 18 years. Thank you so much. Let's go to uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Giannotti. Uh, I'm a physician uh, out of the Houston area, but I work here in town with Symmetria Recovery, which is uh, mainly an opioid treatment program, um, also dealing with some other substance use disorders, so I help um, work with them. And uh, I have a private practice in the Houston area. I practice uh, addiction medicine 100% of the time, and then I work with some other clinics, including another Symmetria location down in Houston. Uh, my background uh, originally is uh, I'm a board-certified anesthesiologist. I practiced for 13 years. Uh, I became interested in addiction treatment when I went to treatment uh, a few years back. And so subsequent to that uh, event, um, I entered a fellowship and got specialized in addiction medicine, uh, became board-certified in addiction medicine, and so now that is the career path that I am, I am uh, embarked on. And uh, it's been... It's been very rewarding, much more so than the 13 years I spent, you know, in the operating room. Um, definitely uh, enjoy what I do. Uh, I feel that I ended up here for a reason. And, uh, you know, uh, my only regret is not being able to do more at the end of every day for people that are in their active disease because there just aren't enough of us yet. But hopefully that with, you know, that is changing. So uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Hi. Um, I'm Lindsay Ruffino, and uh, I am the opioid crisis in America. Um, I uh, went to a and I graduated with a genetics degree I, and an anthropology degree. I got my master's. I'm a cancer research scientist for MD Anderson Cancer Center. And in 2006, I was in a car accident, and I was prescribed... Um, uh, opioids for my pain and it just it just spiraled out of control I guess um, and I only went to heroin because I could no longer afford uh, my prescription pain meds because I, I couldn't keep up my prescription couldn't keep up with my pain and so I started buying them illegally and I could no longer afford that and heroin was a, a, cheap alter, a cheaper alternative. And it's certainly nothing I'm proud of, and it's certainly something I feel like I should have been smarter about, but you just know. Thank you. You just ne you never know. I mean, it, you, you, you never know who, who is gonna spiral out of control, I guess. But uh, I'm in recovery now, and I am a big proponent of uh, medically assisted therapies or mats like Suboxone uh, because I believe they saved my life. So thank you for having me here tonight. Hi, I'm Joy Alonzo. I'm faculty at the College of Pharmacy, and I'm a specialist in uh, psychoactive substances and I'm interested in mental and behavioral health disorders. Um, I'm also the only certified recovery coach in the Brazos to th that we know of, anyway. <laughs> so, um, and that we, so that's a new certified position in the state of Texas, which is a peer recovery support specialist. So um, I'm the faculty director of a student-led program uh, called Operation Naloxone, and we specialize in providing opioid overdose education and naloxone distribution in the community. Uh, to date, we've uh, actually distributed about 500 kits, and we've had five reversals. So that means five lives saved. So we're hoping to do a lot more of that work. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. We're so really fortunate to have these experts come and share their experiences with us. Um, I think our student ambassadors are here. If the audience has some questions, we're gonna go over some general questions first, but please write your questions down and pass them to the side. So let's just sort of, I'm gonna start with kicking off some questions. And we've heard a little bit about this, but I'd like to ask each of our panelists what do you think the local impact is from your perspective? So not your personal impact, but what local impact do you see in the Brazos Valley? 
Well, I think that one of the major problems I see in the Brazos Valley is a lot of stigma. Um, and I think that that's really harmful and unfortunate because we need to stop calling people addicts and we need to say that they have, they suffer from substance use disorder, just different disorders. And, and I think um, one fortunate thing I can say is I've never, in my experience in this community, see, has, I've never seen so many options for treatment here, which is a wonderful thing. But I think that the, um, the, one of our major problems is I'm so grateful that we have him sitting here because a lot of our medical staff in the community are not trained in addiction. And I've, I've seen that with my ex own experiences. And that's a, that's a massive problem that we need to educate the community. We need to, um, one, one big barrier also is we need to get it out, get out there that we do have options like naloxone and that we can save lives with naloxone and we've saved a lot of lives. Um, but I think the stigma is the biggest thing that I, I struggle with because, you know, we, we, the relapse rate is no different than diabetes or high blood pressure, but if you come into the ER with another high blood pressure attack, you know, you're not thrown out the door, you know, or, or, or like you talked about medication assisted treatment, you know, um, do we say, let's just do some therapy, but we're not going to give you any high blood pressure meds. You know, we, we really don't do that. You know, we, you know, we say, let's give you some high blood pressure medicine and talk about your diet or, or whatever. So I think these are some things that need to be worked on majorly and the stigma that people that suffer from this disease, and this disease affects, just to personally share with you all, um, you know, I lost my son to an overdose. Um, he was a military person that went to Afghanistan and, um, the hydrocodone was the final thing that took him over the edge, so he was 23 years old. So that's my personal impact. I know she was talking about community impact, but that does affect our community. My granddaughter lost her father. You know, I lost my son. Um, it affects everybody. You know, it takes a village, like we've heard before, to treat this disease and to help people that struggle. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so, of course, I'm from Houston, um, but my, my observations in the community here are similar to other communities in that, um, I'm going to spin it from a different angle, the, one of the impacts I'm seeing a lot of is people who have been legitimately prescribed opioids at some point who are sort of left out, left out on their own, you know, um, whether they're coming from another physician who's no longer willing to prescribe you know, or it has progressed to the point where they're using street drugs or heroin and they don't know where to turn, you know, and then that obviously turns into, you know, there's a certain number of overdoses that, you know, that's plucking people right out of our society that, that, that are, are part of our, you know, when we lose people, we lose a part of our, of our society. And so, I mean, I don't know how to say that in a better way, but, uh, you know, fundamentally, it takes a toll. You know, when when a when a mother dies, uh, maybe her kids don't have a mother anymore. You know, and that 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 takes a toll in generations to come. So, um, it's a lot of stuff that we don't necessarily see, but but I know it's happening, and uh, so that's just my comment on it. I would also agree the stigma um, that surrounds addicts is is. is it's debilitating. And what I don't know if people understand is that, and, and I know anyone who's ever had this issue will back me up, withdrawing from opioids, I, I, I lived overseas for many years. When I graduated a and I went and worked, uh, did development work. I was, a, I was a cholera prevention specialist. I've had cholera, I've had malaria, I, I've had a litany of, of foreign diseases, and I would take them all at the same time before having to go through opioid withdrawal again, because it is horrific. And it is, and, and I know other addicts who have said they would go through childbirth. I mean, any, anything you can think of, withdrawal is painful. And it is, your whole body and your mind together are in the worst excruciating pain possible. And that is what adds to our relapse rate, and that is why I personally believe in medically assisted therapies, because it takes away some of that pain. But it's not a 
weakness of character as much as it is trying to avoid the most excruciating pain you have, will ever feel in your life. So I wish that there was more education for that, that kind of reality. Thank you, Lindsay. And Joy? Well, I really wish the correctional officers that uh, work in juvenile detention were here tonight because uh, Dr. Rory and I were on a call a couple weeks ago with them when we were planning this event. And um, here's, a, here's kind of a snapshot of how bad things are, and these statistics aren't aggregated in the state of Texas. Um, that the correctional officer told us that 65% of the, 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 the juveniles in detention are there because of drug-related issues. Um, and that personally, she had reversed four overdoses in her intake office just this year alone, where kids came in in a state that they overdosed before she could even intake them into the detention center. She had used Narcan right there in her office. And so those kinds of statistics are not aggregated anywhere. Fatal overdose, we have very poor mortality data in this state to begin with, and non-fatal overdoses is even worse. You know, if we reverse an overdose and you get up and walk out of the ER and refuse any more treatment, I don't have any way to track that. I'm just gonna leave you with this. Uh, the state of Texas has 34 fetal and maternal deaths per every 100,000 live births, 34. You might not have like a perspective on how bad that is. In Japan, it's six fetal and maternal deaths per 100,000. The state of Texas is 34. The number one cause of fetal and maternal death rates is opioid overdose. Thank you. So we've talked a little bit about the impact. People have talked about the solutions. So the last sort of formal question is, what are some barriers to, I mean, if we know what needs to be done, what are the barriers and how do we get around the barriers? Um, I think some of the barriers are um, that people, like you were saying, people feel more like it's a moral thing or uh, they have no character and, and what people need to understand and we need to educate on is the fact that addiction is a brain disease that you didn't ask for um, and it is a disease that there is treatment for and we can recover from. Um, but unfortunately, we still have so little information out there that people, you know, are told they're bad, you know, and they're, they're you know, like she was saying, addicts, you know, hide your purse kind of thing instead of, you know, let's look at this as a brain disease that it is and treat. And if somebody's on opiates and we just expect them to stop, it's not going to happen. Because when withdrawal hits and, and when we detox someone, where's the treatment? You know, we can't just put somebody in a hospital and detox them and not offer treatment after detox. They're not going to get better. You know, and what happens is then they're at higher risk for overdose because they've had a period of abstinence and their tolerance level may have dropped and they get out and use all, all, the same amount they were using and then we have overdose happen. So I think it's just a matter of time before some, you know, fentanyl or something like that comes through our community and it's even worse. So I think that we need to make sure that we get this out there, that we let uh, the community know that, that addiction is a brain disease just like any other disease and that people don't ask for it, but they are responsible to get recovery. It's just like if you have cancer, if you don't go get some help for your cancer, you're going to die. If you don't get help for addiction, you'll probably die or end up in prison. Or, you know, overdose, like you were saying, have overdose happen that, you know, we don't even have documentation of. Um, so I think that's important, getting more documentation out, getting more, you know, it's good to see so many students in the room tonight. So, um, you know, so share this with your peers and, and let's get this education out there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to piggyback on that and, and agree with, you know, stigma being a major factor. But, you know, also just the way our healthcare system is set up, um, it's pretty broken. Um, access to treatment is a huge problem. When people do have access to treatment, it can often be very expensive. And so that, that's what I often see people, you know, electing not to get treatment or to get less treatment than is recommended, it comes down to, to dollars and cents. And I think it's a really sad state that, that you know, for such, a, for such an advanced country, 
in the developed world that we have that problem, you know. And then when we do send people to treatment, we do it for two or three or four weeks, which is really just scratching the surface. I mean, treatment is lifelong, right? And it has to start with a pretty good chunk of time of removing that individual from the unsafe environment, putting them in a safe environment and, and letting them start engaging in recovery. You know, I have family that lives overseas and, and their treatments are six months, 12 months. Uh, and, you know, yeah, it's harder to get a bed, but at the same time, their outcomes are undoubtedly better than ours with, you know, less than 30 days. So it's really many factors, uh, but those are some of the bigger ones that I see. I would also say the stigma, but I, I'm actually going to branch out a little bit and say just our, the stigma behind mental health in general. Uh, every addict I've ever known has had suffered from a mental health issue, and they're taking drugs to, to treat that. They're self-medicating, and we don't, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to get a counselor here in Bryan College Station, but it is next to impossible. I don't even understand how every doctor can prescribe opioids, but we have three, three doctors in our community of how many hundreds of thousands of people that can prescribe treatments. I don't even understand that. And, and I think that if we were to break down some of that, it, it would greatly improve things. Thank you. Enjoy. So I, Dr. Byington made a couple remarks about this earlier, that uh, our medical uh, education, our pharmacy education, our nursing education does not include uh, pain management uh, modalities. And additionally, it doesn't include hardly anything about uh, the science of addiction medicine. So, uh, you know, you ha to have access to treatment, you have to have clinicians that are actually trained to be able to provide medication-assisted treatment the way Dr. Gianetti can do, and um, we just don't we just don't provide that training. So, uh, hopefully, that'll change. Okay. So, these are some questions from the audience, and the first is sort of a personal reflection. Uh, through your experience of use, what do you feel helped you get to treat to get to treatment? and to stay sober. So for anyone who's had a disorder, what do you think? Sure. Um, I lived with shame for a good decade, and, and it almost crippled me. And uh, I eventually just honestly found the right help uh, of people who helped me not be so ashamed. And because I struggled with whether or not, I, I, it took me forever to say I had a disease because I'm a cancer scientist and I thought that was a real disease and that this was something that I had chosen to do. But then the more, because I do research, the more I looked at how some of the early uh, research that was done for you know addiction was flawed. It's drastically flawed and, and how, because I, I, I was looking at the mice, the mouse in the cage and they don't have moral issues and yet they still become addicts and um, there were just a few uh, eye-opening moments that, and just being tired of living with shame that really, you know, everybody's journey is going to be different and it's going to be personal, but finding the right help, but it has to be out there. And I was very lucky to find it. Uh, for me, you know, it, 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 took, um, it took hitting that bottom. And, and, you know, what the, the gentleman in the video was talking about is very relevant, and that's usually, you know, and I like to think of it in terms of, you know, behavioral science, like it's when the pain of, of when the pain of continuing the, the use it, it outweighs, you know, the pain of stopping, essentially, right? Like, you just get to such a, you're, you're so beat down that you're willing to try anything, and you're willing to make changes that you just were unable to do before. It's a very powerful disease and it works on that part of our brain that is subconscious, that keeps us alive and that helps us survive and procreate, right? So it's very powerful. It has a, it has a hold of us that, on us that we're not even aware of. Um, and that's where the drugs work. So, you know, the person who's in an addictive state is truly out of control until they get to that point where they are just at rock bottom. And, and for most people, I think that's what it does take. I'd like to just add though that I, I would never have successfully been sober had it not been for medically assisted therapies like Suboxone that, that took away the, the, the pain that comes with um, withdrawal. Thank you. 
So uh, this is going to be for our pharmacist, Dr. Alonzo. <laughs> what pain relief medications are good alternatives to opioids, and are they covered by insurance plans and affordable alternatives? So looking at pain relief medications, alternatives to opioids, and who's going to be paying for these? So uh, there's a couple of uh, alternatives that obviously, you know, everybody's familiar with ibuprofen and with, uh, you know, that which is Motrin or Naproxen, Naproxen. So those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And for a lot of, um, you know, issues like uh, dental procedures, that might, that might be enough. Also, you know, I think we got to change our lens a, a little bit. Uh, that the, the idea that you're going to have some, a, a surgery and be completely pain-free, that's probably not, uh, that, that's something that's developed over the last 30 years. And prior to the last 30 years, we actually didn't manage pain 100%. You know, you didn't expect to get sh a rotator cuff surgery and walk out and be pain-free. Now your expectation for that kind of day surgery is to be pain-free. And really, those medications, you know, what, what initially what we tried to do was just take the edge off so you could function, but you're, you're not pain free so, and, until you heal. So I think like uh, maybe the, the, the lens of treatment has to change a little bit too. Um, and then there are other drugs, uh, we, you know, uh, my, one of my really awesome nurse practitioners, Dr. Pulliam, we were talking about the use of gabapentin or Neurontin for different types of pain and how that actually is turning into a drug of abuse now as well and is gonna start to be a controlled substance. Um, so we're kinda, you know, some of those we're overusing. Uh, there's some other drugs, uh, one's called Cymbalta, which is act was actually developed as an antidepressant, which has some pain management capabilities. And then there's some research on another drug that's uh, from the anesthesiology world, which is called ketamine, which seems to have some properties that are pain. Uh, and for years, we've been trying to isolate uh, cannabinoids and take away the psychoactive component and try to capitalize on the pain management component. Haven't been, haven't found that right, that, that great compound yet, but we keep looking. So, I mean, it is not something that isn't being explored, but right now, the state of the art of pain management is still opioids. If you develop some sort of cancer problem, I assure you, you are not going to want to be managed with acupuncture. <laughs> you know, that's not going to do it. So, I mean, these are drugs, unlike some of the illicit substances like, like, well, like cocaine. I mean, there is no medical use for cocaine right now, you know, so we don't really use it. Opioids are, are a drug that we have to, we, we still need in medical practice, and we're going to have, and, but we have to do a better job of uh, managing expectations and providing alternatives, and maybe, maybe uh, other other modalities that are uh, you know we're going to have to think out of the box. Okay, so a, another question came, and it's for you, and it is, how do you get a naloxone kit? The ah! short answer. The short <laughs> answer is. The short answer. Okay, so um, Texas, uh, you, you know, provided uh, legislation. Uh, that anybody, any person in the state of Texas can go to any CVS, any Walgreens, and any Walmart, and you can ask the pharmacist for a naloxone rescue kit, and you can be issued one. You do not need a prescription unique to you. So you can, and there's a prescription at the state level that's written for everybody in the state of Texas. If you have health insurance, it will be billed to your insurance and you'll pay your copay for it. If you don't have health insurance, you'll have to pay for it, and it might be kind of on the expensive side. Ergo, why we started Operation Naloxone, so we could provide uh, free kits to individuals. Uh, all you gotta do is come listen to our spiel on how to recognize an overdose. So if you're interested in seeing what uh, a, a Naloxone kit looks like, grab me afterwards and I'll show you mine. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question for Dr. Gia. Um, Giannotti, what steps can health professionals take to get more experience with substance use um, disorders, and how can we do better? So uh, that's a great question. Um, 
you know, it, it's, it's about continuing education. It's about educating the new doctors that are coming out. The problem is that I'm just amazed that even with everything that's been going on in our country, we still don't do a lot of training. You know, um, I mean, we have to do a certain number of CMEs or continuing med medical education credits, per, you know, to maintain our licenses and such. And there's just really very little requirement for this. Um, so, you know, if it were up to me, it, it would be part of every medical school curriculum. Uh, it would be part of every residency curriculum, including rotations where those physicians would see and treat patients with substance use disorders. Um, we tend to be very reactive in our society, and I'm sure that this will all happen, but it's really lagging behind the problem in a big way. Thank you. Our next question, and Lindsay, you've mentioned this, um, what's, what are the panelists' thoughts on medication-assisted treatment, but how long is too long to be relying on methadone or suboxone as a treatment? So sort of talk to us about MAT and the time. Is this something that's lifelong? Let me, uh, let me just say, there is no time frame in treatment. We know that it works. We know that it keeps people alive and that it helps them engage recovery. We used to think in the past, the old school thought was you, you get people on it for a little bit, get them straight, and then take them off. That's not always the right thing to do. So it really depends on the patient. Some people may do it for a couple of months, ideally six to 12 months at a minimum, and then others may do it for a lifetime. I have some patients in Houston that have been on methadone since 1984, and they're doing great, so. Yeah, I, um, I happen to uh, wean down uh, over a period of months, and uh, that's, and so I, I was only on for about six months, I guess, but, um, but and I do wanna specify, a lot of these therapies have, naloxone in them to where you, you cannot, you, 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 there's no high you can get off of these. There is, it's absolutely blocked. Um, it, it, it's like taking, I don't know, like an aspirin or something. I mean, there's absolutely no euphoria. There's no feeling. There's no, high, I mean, that's not the same with methadone necessarily, but uh, with, with uh, a lot of these new ones coming out, it, it is. It prevents you from feeling anything other than not wanting to die, <laughs> or not wanting your body to turn inside out. And so, um, I just kind of wanted to make that point because uh, it, it's not substituting one high for another. Thank you. I have a question for Cindy. On a local, state, and national level, how can the laws become more progressive to help fix the opioid crises and reduce the legal um, penalties for substance-induced crimes. So this is really for our criminal justice people, but being in sort of BV CASA, do you have some comments on the legal aspects? Well, I think that, um, I think that everybody that um, gets arrested for a, a drug charge should have an option of, of treatment versus incarceration. Um, incarceration, we know, doesn't work. I think um, 80% of our prisons are full of people with substance use disorders that need treatment. And we lock them up and they get off the drug and they get out and they go right back on the drug. So, um, you know, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Safe P. Uh, Safe P is a felony uh, drug treatment program that's offered through the prison system. And then they get out and go through a halfway house type setting and then they're released back into society. And that tends to help a lot. Um, sometimes it's a harsh way of, of treatment, you know, because I'm one of the, these counselors that say, let's love the person with substance use disorder until they can love themselves. Um, that's kind of my way of treating this disease. But um, I, I think that in car we're, we're, we're finding out it doesn't work. I think that we need to spend more money on treatment than we do in incarceration. However, when we get to the point that someone has had the option of treatment over and over and they're breaking the law and putting society at risk, you know, we have to incarcerate. So, um, you know, that's kind of what I think about that. Thank you. So this is a question. I'm not sure who wants to answer this one. What is the research into environmental factors with opioid addiction? Um, 
issues. And so this is, somebody has quoted the mouse in the cage experiments demonstrating the impact or the effects of environment on addictive behaviors. So who wants to talk about the impact of the environment? So, actually, I just read a study yesterday, and this is work that we are actually planning on doing, uh, looking at the uh, person as a whole person, and including their work environment, um, their habits, uh, possibly genetic, uh, genetic, you know, aspects of, uh, you know, their makeup that would make them more susceptible to, um, you know, opioid, uh, use disorder than other people are. Um, you know, I, there's, I, I always worry about, you know, and I talk to the, the FMPs and the docs all the time that there's, we got certain people that if we prescribe an opioid for them, they sit, they, they'll immediately go like, I feel great. This is like a warm sweater for my insides. And you worry about those people immediately. Those are the, but why doesn't everybody react that way? And they don't. And so what, you know, are they fast metabolizers? Are they slow metabolizers? Is there something about their work, their social isolation, their, their um, you know, their, their uh, childhood that has conspired to make them more susceptible to opioid use disorder than not? So right just now, I just put in a grant for an epigenetic study uh, with a, a, a co another colleague uh, on studying, you know, so we're planning on genetically profiling a number of people that have opioid use, to, use disorder and trying to compare them with people who don't. And then uh, with another colleague, Mark Bender, we're looking at like uh, keystroke, you know, uh, it, it, can you predict from the keystrokes of certain types of workers and oil and gas workers seem to be particularly susceptible to opioid use disorder. And what is it about there? Is it a dangerous work environment that it conspires against them? You know, so we, we are doing a lot of research on that, but previous to that date in 2011, when somebody at the CDC noticed like, hey, did you notice that the number of traffic fatalities is less than the number of overdose fatalities? I, nobody, you, you know, this just wasn't an area that had a lot of uh, funding available to uh, assess. I, I just wanted to add to that, you know, I heard somebody say one time, a psychologist say one time that genetics load the gun for this disease, environment pulls the trigger, and we're finding a lot of trauma history along with addiction, and if we think about brain development when a child is a baby is born, you know, a lot of the brain's not developed yet, so environment develops the brain. You know, it's a lot easier to study genetics than it is to study environment, but, you know, I, and I also heard a Duke, a Duke addictions um, doctor say at a, at a substance abuse conference, he said, I don't want to hear counselors saying to people anymore, what's your drug of choice? Because drugs don't choose the, the person, the, the person, I mean, the drug chooses the person, not the person choosing the drug. Like you said, somebody can take an opioid and be up all day and cleaning the house and doing everything, whereas someone else is sleeping for 10 hours. You know, so there's, is that, that the environment developed that brain a lot, you know, the brain has a fingerprint differently than someone that didn't have so much trauma. So, you know, those are things to think about. Thank you. Remember when I said that um, the statistics in Texas are probably underreported because opioids are not a reportable condition in Texas? So here's the question. I don't know the answer, but I'm hoping one of the panelists do. How many states in the U.S. Um, have opioids as a reportable cause of death? Does anybody know? Is it the majority and Texas is the exception? Texas is the exception. Texas is considered a non-reporter by the CDC, and to my knowledge, it's the only state that's a non-reporter. And we have a long history of uh, doing things on our own. <laughs> the CDC. And we don't report to each other either. We have no state aggregated data. Yeah, I'm yes. serious. No, uh, but I'm wearing a fez and a funny hat, and we'll. <laughs> but um, so uh, we have uh, data from the from. So we did have the, the data that we have, uh, which is Medicaid data that's owned by the state. So we can see that, and we can see the CMS data, some of it, but all the everybody who's privately insured, no, we can't see that, and um, we don't we don't uh, require reporting. So if you have a non-fatal overdose, especially. 
you just walk away. So one of the things that we've been looking at is hospitalization or ER records. And that's why we know Texas has a problem, because they do have causes for admission. So we know that the problem is much bigger. And as Dr. Alonso said, if we see babies being born in Texas addicted, we know there's a problem. That is the one statistic that has to be reported is fetal and maternal death. And that is so bad here, that's third world bad. So here's a question that I know the answer to. Uh, how can we help with the task force? So we talked about the task force being with all the components of the Health Science Center, but we also have students. So if you're a student and you wanna get involved, there's actually a form on our website. We have um, faculty that are involved in the Health Science Center, but we know this is a bigger issue than just the Health Science Center. So if you're affiliated with other departments and colleges around campus, we actually have another group and it's called the Transdisciplinary um, Research Collaboratory, Opioid Research Collaboratory. So if you're a faculty member or researcher and you wanna get involved, we welcome you. We have a third group for the community and we're calling it the um, Opioid Action Alliance of Texas. And we've gotten people, whether it is the healthcare hospitals and clinics in town, the Chamber of Commerce, public health, every single unit, every sector that is involved, impacted, and can be a helper. So how you can be involved is being active in your community, whether you are volunteering or if you're in business, you know, you talked about um, opioids in the workplace, again, is a hidden issue, but we know that's a problem. So wherever you are, the issue is be involved. Let us know what you're doing. One of the things that Dr. Byington talked about is we want to educate every single health um, a sciences student in opioid um, addictions or opioid sort of education and also naloxone distribution. So we're gonna be out in the community and we hope that everybody here will be out with us. So how we're gonna end up is, I'm gonna pass the mic and I really want people just to spend a moment, what is the take home message that you want the, um, the audience to know? And we'll start with you, Cindy. Yes. And we're really, really happy to be here. I'm uh, here with another officer, and we just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to make sure that we are known. We are uh, one of the oldest universities in Texas, but one of, one of the newest recovery organizations. And this is in high contrast to other universities um, in Texas that have been around, in some cases, for decades, whose uh, membership is uh, right in the hundreds. Right now, we have about a dozen. Statistically, the numbers just don't match up. So we are trying with our small group now to really make friends, gain visibility, support the students that need uh, you know, our help. Because the, we know that they're out there, but they're alone, they're, they're miserable. <laughs> and, and so I, I, you know, we, I'm another face of recovery, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to see me after. Thank you so much, and please get in touch. Um, before we have our final remarks, Dr. Alonso Joy, do you want to talk about the ROSC that just uh, got formed in the Brazos Valley? So, uh, yeah, the, um, so my friends, the winds are here. <laughs> so they are, uh, we had a couple of false starts, but uh, Nancy Wynn has been really super instrumental in uh, standing up the, uh, our, our Brazos Valley recovery-oriented um, system of care. And that incorporates uh, treatment uh, folks, uh, also correctional folks, the specialty court representatives, representatives from sober living um, houses, uh, you know, potential recovery coaches, <laughs> um, BV Casa, all the representatives from the uh, PRC, which is the Prevention Resource Center. Um, who else? Who am I missing? Um, Texas Ag Life, who provides a lot of. Uh, preventive services in the high schools here. Um, 
And so we all get together and the idea is to uh, make sure that everybody knows about all the assets that are in the community for treatment and for prevention and that we are, are able to uh, share, share resources and stand up uh, various other types of educational events to make sure that the community is aware. So um, congratulations to the ROSC finally for, uh, look, you know, being, we had our very first public event uh, last Monday, which I thought was really well attended because the College Station ISD and Bryan ISD uh, as of October 1st will be implementing random drug testing uh, for uh, the students there, which, you know, to, to it, as a deterrent. So uh, we're really hoping to also have access to treatment too. So um, that's, uh, that's the ROSC and uh, it's a super recovery friendly, you know, and we'd love to have the Aggie Recovery Network there. <laughs> so, yeah, at the Brazos Valley Council of Government, which is right on uh, 29th Street. And so, we can put that on our website. Yeah. We have a lot of events. Our task force website will sort of put that on for the Wednesday meetings. Now let's go back to Cindy. And the comment is, what is your final thought that you want to leave with the audience? Um, I, would, I would say my final thought would be that if you are suffering with this disease or you know someone that is, to let them know and educate them that there is help available. Like I said before, there's more treatments in our community than ever before. Um, also, just to throw this out there, even if there's not insurance or money, um, BV Casa does have state funding, so we can take care of you for no charge. We can build a state for your care. So, um, and I like the fact that, um, you know, that, that we're talking about educating the medical, you know, residents and doctors because, you know, that is a major problem. We find that doctors over prescribe opiates and then they decide that they might get a little nervous and stop and then that person is out there with nothing and and sick and 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 like go into the heroin issue and and all of that and the you know so what I, I really would like to leave out there is the fact that the, uh, to let the judgment go the stigma go to educate as many people as we can that it's not your fault that you have this disease but it's your responsibility to get better and to reach out for help um, because there's so much help in our community right now so I uh, thank everybody for being here yeah, kind of a little bit along the same lines. I mean, what I would love to see in our society is for us to quit uh, pretending like this isn't a problem. And you know, for for most community, for all communities, really. I mean, I think we were talking earlier. If if a, a particular family doesn't have the issue in their family, they definitely know somebody who does. This does not uh, really exclude anyone. And so, you know, we need to talk about it. And this includes, you know, beyond opioids, alcohol, which is, you know much bigger problem. It's not quite as dramatic or uh, it doesn't kill people quite as quickly, but it's a huge problem. You know, we have a huge substance use issue in this country. We need to start talking about it and take the stigma away so that, you know, people aren't afraid to come forward and seek treatment. Um, you know, seeking treatment is not, I, I remember being very, very frightened, very terrified actually. And it was really one of the best experiences I've ever gone through in my life. You know, um, I learned a lot about myself and I continue to and it, it you know, it, it once you get over that fear, it's a really cool experience. So like she said, if you're somebody who might be struggling or you know somebody who is, encourage them to, to get help. Yeah, similarly, I, I, I wish that, you know, the take home message would be, and this might not be who I need to be talking to because we're all here. And so we all are all aware that there is a problem just by being here, uh, but, for the population of this community, our, we've got some seriously, we have a lack of services. No offense to the services that are available, but we, we need more. I know there are more addicts out there, and I don't know if it's the stigma involved, but I, I, I wish that all of us you know, would go home and try and break some of that because um, you know, I, and I guess maybe I, I moved from Austin where there was sober yoga and sober bowling and sober, you know, and I, I just, I wish that we would embrace that a bit more in, in this area because for this population, I know there are more people out there. 
So I always have the same message. If you don't have a naloxone kit, get one. <laughs> know how to use it. Know the signs of overdose. Um, uh, we're going to have a, a lot more. Uh, I've, I've, you know, gone around and we've had a lot of events in the community where we gave them out. Um, we're going to have more of those. Uh, and you can always go to the pharmacy and get one. But if you don't have, you know, it's kind of like CPR. How many people here have a fire extinguisher at home? So pretty much everybody, right? How many people here have used it? Yeah. So here's your fire, your new fire extinguisher. Yeah, so um, I want everybody, you know, the, the Surgeon General says so, that you need it. <laughs> and it's, just remember, it's not about you. It's about other people. You don't perform CPR on yourself, right? It's for others. So this is the one way you can actually save a life. So thanks. I would certainly like to, pa to thank our panelists. This has been wonderful. I'd like to thank the audience for being here, uh, for showing your concern and care, and for asking some really good questions. We have an opioid reflection wall, and for those people who came early, I think they've already made comments. But we all know that this crisis is more than just the numbers. So if you have a personal reflection, go up and put it on. And even if you put one up, I've talked to one of my friends in nursing, and she says, I've been to that wall seven different times. So let's you know, put up as many reflections as you would like. There's some flyers outside if you want to hear more, learn more about the Opioid Task Force. If you have something you would like us to put on our website, send us a message. And again, thank you so much for everyone who's come out tonight. And Our panelists have agreed to be up here for a few moments. If you were too shy to send forth a question, feel free to rush the panelists. <laughs>